Good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending my presentation today. My name is Holger Caesar. I'm an assistant professor at TU Delft, and today I'm going to talk about autonomous vehicles from imperfect and limited labels. Let's start with an overview. I will talk briefly about myself to introduce myself, then I will try to motivate this topic. I will look at how uh, data sets used to be labeled by humans, such as the new scenes data set. Then I will talk about our recent project, which uses auto labeling for scalability in the new plan data set. And finally, I will talk about future work. And this is work done first in Motional and now in TU Delft. Brief introduction of myself. Um, I came from Germany, did a PhD in Edinburgh with Vittorio Ferrari, then worked for four years in the autonomous vehicle industry as a principal research scientist in Motional. Um, and finally, now I'm an assistant professor at TU Delft, working in the intelligent vehicles group on different topics in the realm of perception, prediction and mapping. So if you've seen, looked at the media anywhere lately, you probably saw that autonomous vehicles are everywhere, all over the media. And every year it seems like they might be just around the corner to come to your house, but they are not just quite there yet. But given that we see huge progress in the field of autonomous vehicles, um, I want to take the time to discuss briefly what are the factors that contribute to this huge progress. So I looked into a few of these factors starting from 2016 until now. For example, better sensors. Uh, if we look at LIDAR, which is kind of the popular sensor for autonomous driving. Um, we had 64 beam lighters, now we have 128 beam lighters with much better quality. And also many companies now start using multiple lighters, up to five lighters maybe. Uh, so you get significant increases in the density of the lighter, many more beams than you had before. So that's roughly a factor of four improvement there. Let's look at the GPU computing power. Um, if we measure that in flops per second uh, per dollar, the, they double around every two years for uh, machine learning GPUs. So in those six years, we saw roughly an increase of 8x. If we look at the backbones, of course, we all know there have been huge improvements in the backbones. So at the time we had roughly Inception V3 with an ImageNet error of 21%. Now we have a Vision Transformers with an error of only 9%. So that's an error reduction uh, on ImageNet by factor 2.3 roughly, which is still pretty strong. And then we have better models specifically for tasks like object detection on Kitty. Um, so they have, for example, Frost on point net in 2016 with 23% uh, error, if you want to phrase it that way, uh, versus graph RCN, a very recent method with only 4% error. So you see that that's roughly a 5.8% uh, times improvement uh, compared to 2016. But of course, the better models in some sense subsume the, the better backbones. Uh, so that's not independent. But what about data sets? So if we look at data sets in 2016, we basically just had one data set, which is called Kitty. It was 1.5 hours of data. Uh, nowadays, and we'll talk about that later, we have new plan data set, which is 1,300 hours uh, of data. So we see that's roughly an 870 times uh, increase in data. Of course, it's unclear at this point how that translates into better performance, and it's also up to us to find suitable methods that work with this amount of data, but it really sticks out that this is a huge uh, aspect of growth here. So I would quickly like to talk about this quality quantity trade-off. Uh, let's assume here we have the annotation quantity and the quality on this axis. And then we have a, a few data sets. We have, for example, Kitty, uh, which is, of course, the, the original data set in this uh, realm um, with low quantity and quality. Then we have new scenes with slightly higher quantity and, and also quality. Uh, and then more lately, we have um, new plan with relatively huge quantity, uh, but of course, lower quality uh, then. And that's, of course, this trade-off that we're seeing. So we look at this kind of Pareto curves we see here, perhaps for a particular budget and for, for another bigger budget, we see these Pareto fronts. And basically all points on these Pareto fronts achieve the same performance, but we cannot know the shape of the curve a priori. So that's very important. Obviously, intuitively, 
you know, quantity and quality form a trade-off, but it's very hard when we design data sets to know in advance um, how the actual performance will be when we use this data set. So let's look at some data sets. These are actually all data sets that I uh, was responsible for since my PhD. Uh, they start from image data sets and then they go into autonomous driving data sets, especially 3D data sets. Um, and you see all except the last row are manually annotated and the projects ranged from maybe um, 500 hours to 15,000 hours um, and 500,000 euros in budget. Now, if we look at this latest project, new plan, it's much bigger. And you will see that the um, annotation time is roughly 10 million hours, which would correspond to something like 400 million euros. Uh, so obviously that is beyond the reach. Uh, not even a company would want to spend that on a, on a public data set at least. Uh, so it's clear that we do need different methods that are able to auto label, and we'll talk about that in a second, data sets to get them with less than full supervision. Okay. In the first part, I would like to talk about human labeling in new scenes. So new scenes is a data set that we've published a few years ago. At the time, there was really mostly Kitty data set, uh, which is of course always the original data set in this space. Then there was Apollo Scapes, which was a, a number of separate benchmarks that weren't really one data set, one consistent data set. Then we released new scenes and quickly there was also Honda and Argoverse. And after the full release, then there was also Lyft, Waymo, Audi, and a number of other data sets. And eventually in 2020, we ex uh, released a second version of that with panoptic and image annotations. So New Scenes was, when we released it, uh, the largest AV data set. It has 1,000 scenes uh, with radar, LiDAR, cameras. It was the first data set to be nicely registered and synchronized across 360 degrees. And we annotated every single bounding box at two hertz. So there's 1.4 million 3D bounding boxes from 23 classes. And of course, you can download the data set for free at this homepage. What was the novelty at that time? Nuisance was the first data set with radar, it had 360 degree coverage, very detailed HD maps with 13 map layers. It had uh, HD map based localization, which was different from just using GPS, rare classes, object attributes, and scene descriptions. And it was very diverse with data coming from, from Singapore and Boston and yeah, very interesting data. Here's a bit more on this diversity aspect. So um, we manually picked all of these scenes to have interesting maneuvers and rare classes, which was very important. Different uh, locations from these cities. We have left hand with right hand traffic, uh, different vehicles and vegetation types, and nighttime and rainy data, which was also unique at that time. Here is a data set comparison from uh, the paper. So we can see at the top uh, 2D data sets, then we have kind of uh, 3D data sets up to new scenes, uh, where new scenes is by far the largest. And then we have uh, data sets since then. And it's quite important that there's essentially no bigger labeled data set than new scenes. So the Waymo data set is very popular at the moment, uh, but it's essentially the same thing, just inflated by uh, doing a denser interpolation of the boxes at 10 hertz rather than 2 hertz. Um, yeah. Some newer data sets are missing here, like Argoverse 2, but still it's important to realize that nobody really annotated much larger data sets. The new trend now is to go into also releasing um, data without any annotations and then working with that. Here's a brief uh, part I want to talk about, uh, something called point pillars, which is a very fast uh, LiDAR-based 3D object detector that we developed. It was state-of-the-art at the time that we released it, but really the focus was on the very high speed up to 100 hertz, and has been implemented in essentially all major 3D detection frameworks uh, and even MATLAB. So the idea is that you pillarize uh, a point cloud, you, you learn the features in there with a point net, then you give that to a standard 2D backbone, standard detection head like SSD, and then you output the predictions. So, Using this as a baseline, which is very commonly done in the literature and also in our papers, um, we can do some experiments. Uh, so what we did here is we trained uh, point pillars and a few other methods with different amounts of data. Um, at the dashed line here, you can see uh, the amount of data you find in the Kitty data set. And then at the end, at 100%, you find the uh, full nuisance data set. And you can see that there's roughly a 70% relative improvement for this method 
uh, versus the kitty amounts of training data and nuisance. Um, so this really shows us that larger data sets are definitely needed and nuisance was an important contribution, of course. So given this data set, we organized a number of challenges, uh, typically CVPR, NURIPS, ICRA, IROS. Um, so one or two challenges every year. And we're going to continue that for CVPR uh, 2023 um, with our new data set. Um, so it's very important for us to always keep the community engaged. One question that we like to look at is, um, are we making progress? And here we see the results from the nuisance detection challenge. It's a little bit outdated now, but essentially you can see the growth from the point pillars baseline. And every year, huge improvements uh, in terms of the performance. So we have MACV, we have some fusion methods, uh, then we have anchor free methods, and in the end, anchor free plus fusion plus a number of other tricks. And we can also see that camera and radar methods are doing much worse than LIDAR. Um, so that's important to have these benchmarks and really see what is working best at the moment. In total, we see a 42% improvement in MAP in, in only 26 months. So to summarize, this data set is manually annotated. It has been cited 1,900 times. Um, similar data sets were published by many other companies and many attributed that they kind of reused our dev kit or our data set conventions and things like that. And then there are also kind of derivative data sets uh, by the community which use new scenes, which was very interesting to us. So you have everything from visual question answering to natural language driving commands, uh, interpretable scene descriptions, and also online mapping, which is very interesting to see. Another aspect I would like to talk about very briefly is that the metrics are really important. Uh, so of course, the standard metrics in object detection is mean average position, whether it's 2D or 3D, um, which is the integral of the recall precision curve averaged over classes. But we did uh, contribute a new uh, metric, which is called the nuisance detection score, NDS, which is essentially the MAP plus a linear combination of other factors which are true positive errors on the translation, scale, orientation, attribute, and velocity. So there's a more holistic approach in some sense to look at different aspects of the, um, the detections rather than just uh, the position and size. Uh, there are also other approaches by Waymo, for example, mean average position uh, weighted by heading MAPH, which is an interesting approach. And then there is from NVIDIA um, something called the planning KL divergence, PKL. So here the idea is basically that you use the detections for planning and um, judging from how close the performance of the planner is to the real uh, recorded scenario, you assign a quality metric to the detections. So we did a study here with uh, the, the authors of that metric on new scenes, uh, try to apply that on a large scale and kind of analyze uh, how this metric works in practice. So given the new scenes data set, um, we had a nice 3D data set, but now a lot of people were asking us for image data sets. So what we did is we created a separate image data set, which has the same kind of data, uh, but is much larger. It's 100,000 images, 800,000 boxes. And then we used active learning to find uh, images with rare and challenging classes. Uh, so for example, you can compute the entropy of the detections. Um, and then of course you want to balance uh, the, the data set to have as many bicycles and other rare classes as possible. And this uh, data set was imp especially important for fusion methods. So for example, we have um, point painting as a, as a method from one of our colleagues, uh, which basically uses uh, image pre-chain network to do fusion between image and LIDAR. And finally, we also created a panoptic LIDAR segmentation data set, which is panoptic new scenes. So for that, we labeled every single LIDAR point in the new scenes data set with a semantic label. Um, and that's very interesting because you don't just get the objects, the foreground objects, but you also get the background classes, so called stuff classes like road, sidewalk, and building. And then we created, um, yeah, of course, a very large data set, but also the first panoptic uh, tracking benchmark uh, challenge. So that was interesting um, to work with. Here is a video from this data set. I will briefly play this back. Unfortunately, data is only at two hertz since that's what the annotations are at. Uh, so it looks a bit stuttering, but you can see very nicely the different colors, green being the trees, uh, turquoise being the road, orange being the vehicles, uh, etc. So you can see very accurate outlines of these labels.
Okay. So now I want to continue to the next plan, which is our latest work, um, which is really uh, how to use auto labeling to scale up data set creation and how we build this new data set called new plan. So if we look at a slightly different task now, it's not perception anymore. Now we're talking about planning and prediction. Um, there is one planning benchmark, which is common road. But this uh, benchmark uh, is basically handcrafted scenarios. Uh, there's some uncertainty modeled, but it's not recorded from a real world. Uh, so it's very interesting as a small scale study, but it's not a large scale real world data set and it lacks, uh, for example, the sensor data. Then we have three really large scale data sets for prediction, but not for planning. These are Argoverse 1, Lyft and Waymo. And they get, of course, bigger over time, uh, or the Argoverse data set was 320 hours, Lyft was more than 1,000 hours, and then Waymo is now 570 hours. Um, the, the diversity increases, so we have in, in Waymo, we have six cities, which is quite amazing. Um, also, all of these data sets have semantic maps that get increasingly more sophisticated over time. One thing that's very important is the quality of the tracks, because if you do uh, prediction or planning, you do need very accurate tracks. So if we look at Argoverse, the tracks were basically on car perception, so it's real time perception uh, and also quite outdated now. Uh, so of course, these tracks are noisy and they're not ground truth quality. In Lyft, uh, you have a similar thing, again, on car perception, noisy uh, tracks. In Waymo, you do have for the first time auto-labeled tracks, we'll talk about that in a second, which are very high quality. So that's the good thing, but still all of these three data sets are only for prediction, not for planning. So that begs the question, do we even need more data in this case for uh, ML-based planning, machine learning-based planning? So there was a paper which showed that going to 1000 hours of, uh, or even more of training data drastically improves ML planning performance. We see here um, the orange arrow indicates the amount of data that you would find in new scenes. So that's 5.5 hours of training data. And if we then go to 1000 hours, we see a drastic improvement in the number of interventions per 1000 miles. And of course, that is kind of correlated to accidents in the, in the real world. Um, the route, of course, of this data set is very small. It's only seven miles and includes only three turns. So we cannot assume that 1000 hours is enough in general. It's enough on this very small uh, dedicated route, but not in general. So this is obviously insufficient to generalize to level five, which is called uh, full uh, autonomy. Um, and also there's no support here for planning or closed loop evaluation. So there was a huge deficit in this existing data set. So what we did was to build NewPlan. NewPlan is the world's first large scale ML based planning benchmark. It is 1,500 hours is now corrected to 1,300 hours of auto labeled data from four cities and uh, it supports closed loop simulation um, and we have real world sensor data around 10% of the of the whole data set released which is of course very big because 130 hours of data is still many many terabytes. So what we did to create this data is we in, we built an offline perception system. So the offline perception system uh, takes in point clouds, performs offline detection, offline tracking, then a track refinement component which refines every single track and then outputs the, the tracks that you see in this video. Um, it's important to understand what offline means. Offline means uh, we have a very resource hungry, a causal perception system. Resource hungry is fine because it doesn't run in real time. We don't have to run it in real time. We can run it on dozens of GPUs in the cloud and that is fine. And a causal means it can look in the past and present, but also the future. So you can essentially optimize over a sequence of 20 seconds. You can do see tracking as a kind of global optimization problem and find the best solution uh, in that space. The advantages are, of course, yeah, no constraints, especially on the hardware side. We can use many, many sweeps past and future and we can find a global optimal solution. And um, in the work of Waymo, uh, they showed that um, they can achieve essentially human level uh, labeling performance of cars at very low IOU thresholds. 
So of course, if you go to very strict IU thresholds, then humans will do better. But if you are OK with kind of loose boxes, which is again this topic of, of lower quality versus high quantity, um, then they will do very well. Basically at the level of human performance. So now let's look at this new plan planning framework. So this framework has several steps. First, you train your ML planner, then you simulate your planner and the agents, kind of the interaction between them. You can measure the performance in a large number of scenarios, and then you can compare and visualize the planners. And there are different kind of planning challenges that we have. Uh, and they differ in the sense that they are open loop or closed loop. So in open loop, you just play back what is in the lock, whereas in closed loop, you kind of really simulate the interaction between either only the ego or the ego and the agent. Here we see the simulation engine that we built. It's very important that this is entirely modular, so you can plug in your own observations, whether it's raw sensors or the, the boxes that we already generated. You can plug in your own planner if you want, your own agent model, your own controller, your own simulation engine that's open loop versus closed loop. And then yeah, we have the metrics engine and we have a, a, also a dashboard to look at the results. Here are some examples of these scenarios. In total, we mined over 70 different scenarios like this. Uh, you see things like uh, unprotected cross turn, um, dense vehicle interaction, jaywalkers in front of the ego vehicle, lane changes. Uh, you, you don't actually see it because it's supposed to be, be a video, but you have to believe me. Um, <laughs> Ego pick up and drop off, uh, and also following other vehicles. Another thing that we did for this was to extract the traffic light status. If we want to simulate things, especially in closed loop, we need to have a traffic light status, and not just for the traffic lights right in front of us, but really for all traffic lights. So we kind of thought backwards, and rather than doing like um, image-based detection, which only works in the in you know, the forward direction, we essentially model the traffic light from the motion that we observe. So we take those tracks, we figure out if they cross the traffic light, then it's quite likely that the traffic light was green. Um, and then we, we use that for our simulation. And the beauty of that is, of course, that it covers all different directions. OK, this is the dashboard that I mentioned, so you can kind of play back uh, what, what is happening in the scene. You can play back your planner and the agents, and you can compute all kinds of metrics and show them and compare between different planners. So in conclusion, new plan is the first large scale ML based planning benchmark. It enables end to end planning. The focus is on closed loop evaluation with reactive agents, and you can contribute your own scenarios, metrics, planners and smart agents. Full data set is available now. Uh, full dev kit is coming soon and there are challenges ongoing for planning and in the future we will also look at smart agents and semantic mapping. So now that we've seen this importance of um, auto labeling and lesser levels of supervision, now I want to look into some future work that I'm now interested in. As you've seen, I, I recently switched from uh, industry to academia. So some of these topics are now uh, my, my kind of future uh, work topics. So one topic that I'm very interested in is collaborative perception. Uh, it's often referred to as vehicle to vehicle communication, vehicle to infrastructure communication. If we talk about uh, communicating with uh, traffic lights, for example, or even we could think about vehicle to aerial communication. If we had some drones in the sky, something like this. Um, this is a very interesting because it will drastically improve safety if it's really accepted by society. Um, and it's therefore an interesting alternative to just improving our perception and planning algorithms. Uh, important here is that we have efficient communication strategies, things like message compression, because we certainly don't want to send raw point clouds from one car to the other. Uh, we need to think about the latency. Um, but then it's also interesting to think about the strategic placement of the infrastructure or aerial sensors. Um, so assuming you had like overhead cameras, where should they be, etc. Um, these are all very interesting things that I, I want to look into. A second problem that I'm interested in is map change detection. So autonomous vehicles make safety critical decisions based on maps. It depends a bit on what strategy they pursue. Tesla has a different pro approach from, from Waymo, for example. Uh, but most of the level four, level five systems use high definition maps. But the huge problem is that these maps become outdated within days and you cannot afford to, to map the entire city again after a few days. So 
it's very interesting to, to look into how do these maps change. And uh, there's almost no academic work on this uh, in, in the autonomous vehicle context. So I, I will have a PhD student starting soon to look into this topic and figure out what are the type of map changes that we see. So in this example here, we see the lane markings have changed, but you could imagine map changes can go far beyond that. Uh, there might not even be a road there anymore or other uh, aspects. How do we detect these uh, changes? Is it a supervised or an unsupervised problem? And of course, also, what are the modalities? Is it uh, image-based, LIDAR-based, etc.? What, what, what do we need to efficiently figure out if the map has changed? And the third problem that I'm interested in is how can you use 3D models as prior knowledge for autonomous vehicles? So this is an idea that is a little bit inspired by a paper by Uber, where they essentially build 3D models from uh, autonomous vehicle data sets. So you can aggregate the point clouds, you can do some symmetry, uh, depth completion, etc. And then you get nice models. And now the question is, how can you use these models? Uh, so for example, you can use data augmentation. Of course, you can paste these point clouds, these models into your existing scenes, but you can also do object detection, phrase it essentially as a shape fitting where you just find the right model, then fit it to the data. And there was a challenge uh, by Baidu Apollo Scaver on that a long time ago. Or perhaps we could even learn irregular shapes and appendices using these models and figuring out like where do they not fit so well. Uh, so that's a very interesting form of prior knowledge that will also lead to requiring less uh, human supervision, label supervision. Okay, that is everything from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. And I would just like to thank all the contributors uh, from Motion and TU Delft. And I would also like to mention that I have a number of applications opening for multiple PhD positions. So if you're interested in this, that please come talk to me uh, at ECCV in Tel Aviv or otherwise via email. Thank you very much.